So the last unit, we spent a fair amount of time breaking down the different parts of the central dogma, uh, talking about transcription, where DNA is transcribed, uh, DNA is read and transcribed into RNA, and then we have translation, whereby mRNA is translated to the subsequent proteins that they encode for. There are layers of regulation that help inform how central dogma occurs. And so we're, that's been dubbed here as extra dogma. Um, and so the two, main, the two main areas of regulation of what informs central dogma here, we're gonna talk about epigenetics and non-coding RNA. And we're gonna talk about them against the backdrop of uh, two syndromes, Klinefelter and Down syndrome. So I'm sure many of you have either uh, had people in your life uh, or people that you've known that, who have Down syndrome, but it's a genetic disorder with a wide range of developmental uh, and physical uh, presentations. Some of the symptoms are brachycephaly, which uh, translates to just a, a shorter head. They have a, there's a change in the morphology of the skull. Uh, there's also uh, brachy, uh, brachydactyly. Uh, there's also duodenal atresia, which is a shortening of the duodenum, a portion of the GI tract. There's also epicanthal folds. That's uh, folds that occur within the eyelids uh, that actually change the, um, the structure or the posture of the eyelids. There's also fifth finger clinodactyly. That's uh, kind of a bending in of the fifth uh, of, the, of the pinky digit towards the fourth digit. Uh, there's also, uh, at the infant stage, hypotonia, which is a decreased muscle tone. Uh, and as a result of that, there are, there are other downstream uh, issues like, like lax ligaments, uh, as well as tendons. Uh, there's also the mental impairment that, that's presented, short stature, and also the a gap between their uh, first and second digits on their feet. In addition to that, uh, the other disorder is Klinefelter syndrome. Uh, this is the most common genetic cause for male infertility. What's interesting, though, is that up to approximately, as, as, what's, as it's been defined recently, uh, about 65% of cases can go undiagnosed. And the symptoms of that present, are presented in a few different key ways. Uh, they have uh, what's referred to as gynecomastia. That's male breast tissue formation. Uh, they have hypogonadism, which is an underdeveloped, underdeveloped sex, uh, sex organs. And finally, they have elevated levels of uh, follicle-stimulating hormone. That's a key hormone that is synthesized in the pituitary gland and is really important for spermatogenesis. And so and with elevated levels of uh, follicle-stimulating hormone, it, we, there's uh, inhibited spermatogenesis uh, within these patients. So those are the differences between those two, uh, two syndromes. Here are some of the ways that they're also similar. They're, both their prevalence and incidence rates are fairly similar with approximately a quarter of a million people uh, in the US and usually between one, in, one to 500 and one to 1,000 births uh, per year. Uh, they appear to occur randomly, there's no known behavioral or environmental factor that changes the probability of either of these things happening. The only connection that's been identified so far is age. Uh, with Down syndrome, uh, a, relationship's been, a relationship has been identified where as the mother's age increases uh, when, the, when the child is born, the likelihood of Down syndrome is higher. Uh, and what's also been demonstrated with Klinefelter syndrome, uh, that age is with the, with the father. As the age of the father increases, there's an increased likelihood for Klinefelter syndrome. The etiology for both of these, uh, they're both caused by defective meiosis. Uh, meiosis is a form of cell replication or cell division that is specific to uh, tissue, tissues within the sex glands uh, for, for germline cells. And so what ends up happening is that the, the chromosomal segregation, the pulling apart of chromosomes during meiosis, uh, what ends up happening is that there's a dysfunction in that chromosomal segregation or the pulling apart of chromosomes into subsequent germ cells that leads to aneuploidy, uh, which is a, a 
incorrect number of chromosomes in the subsequent cells during meiosis. And so during, with Down syndrome, you get an extra chromosome of uh, chromosome 21. With Klinefelter, you get an extra X chromosome uh, that emerges. Another name for Down syndrome is also trisomy 21, uh, because again, you have two copies of chromosome 21, you get an extra, which is third. So usually any disorder where there's a third copy of that chromosome is usually referred to as trisomy. So Down syndrome is referred to as trisomy 21. Uh, so chromosomal aneuploidy, it often is, uh, results in what we refer to as gene a gene, elevated gene dosage. That typically just refers to an elevation in the number of copies of that gene. As you can imagine, when we typically have two copies of a gene, one, from each, one on each chromosome, we have a certain set number of copies. When you get a third chromosome, you get a 50% increase in the copies typically that, uh, of that gene, which usually, not always, typically refers to 50% more RNA, and not always, but sometimes 50% more copies of the protein. And so it, this boils, da boils down to a gene dosage problem. Uh, but what's, what's important to note is uh, the, the presentation of Down syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome, while, while both of them uh, are de gene dosage problem, there's a, an appropriate question of why are the symptoms uh, so different between the two? One possible thought could be that uh, perhaps there's a difference in the size of the chromosomes that might explain why perhaps Down syndrome might seem more severe compared to Klinefelder. Well, it, it's, it's, no, it's worth noting that chromosome 21 is actually smaller than the X chromosome. And so it's not explained by the size of the chromosome or the subsequent genes that are encoded by each chromosome. And so what we're going to try later in this lecture, we're going to try and define what ex explains why there's such a difference, even though uh, the, the, the size of the genes don't explain what's happening. So there are two definitions. The first part of uh, extra dogma that we're going to talk about is epigenetics. Epigenetics uh, is actually how it's defined is a really controversial thing. Uh, if you talk to a geneticist, that's uh, been in the field for 50 years versus one that's been in the field for the last 10 or 15 years, you're gonna get, uh, it's a bit of a contentious subject and you're, get, you're gonna get wildly different responses that sometimes at conferences lead to really uh, enthusiastic uh, and argumentative debates. Uh, and so typically epigenetics occurs at the, at the DNA gene level. A traditional or more historic definition that defines epigenetics uh, as a st stable and heritable cellular modification that impacts gene regulation, but not the sequences itself, the genome itself. Whereas a more modern definition uh, would be defined, uh, possibly defined as a structural adaptation of the chromosomal region so as to register and signal and perpetuate altered states. Uh, and so these can be more, these can be both heritable as well as transient and non-heritable. And so if you want to have fun, you can ask an older geneticist what they think, and they're going to get a little, a little hot and bothered. Um, an example of stable and heritable epigenetics. Um, this was an example of this was first uh, earlier defined using what was referred to as the agouti mouse. There's the agouti gene locus. Again, locus is like the site of our DNA at a specific gene that defines, uh, that defines something. And so the agouti gene locus defines the pigmentation of the fur on these mice. And what ended up happening is that as uh, the diet of the mother changed over time, uh, the subsequent uh, agouti gene locus was altered so as to change the fur coat of mice from that, same, uh, from that same breeding pair. And so the coat color was modified simply by changing the mother's diet. And that's an example of uh, changes that occurred because of an environmental factor at the agouti gene locus in the mother that led to changes that were inherited in the subsequent litters where their color changed at that gene locus because of inherited changes by an environmental factor. Uh, there's a lot of examples of, of this. Uh, historically, an example is during World War II, um, the Nazis would, uh, in, effort, in an effort to, um, in an effort to terrorize people, they would uh, cut off food supply chains and starve people throughout the winters in some regions. So in the Dutch, uh, 
there was such a severe starvation that the subsequent um, stress and uh, uh, lack, lack of nourishment, lack of food led to inherited changes in subsequent, uh, the subsequent generation where they had higher rates, 10% higher, but still statistically significant, higher rates of obesity, higher rates of uh, mortality, or I guess a, a shorter lifespan that when you, uh, when you factor in for other variables, it was demonstrated that that winter as a result of what the Nazis did led to an inherited change because of an environmental factor. And so epigen part of what epigenetics can explain is how there are factors that affect the state of our genes that can be passed down and inherited to subsequent generations. An example of that is smoking. There are inherited changes that, that occur as a result of smoking that can increase the rate of asthma in subsequent generations. An example of transient uh, or plastic changes uh, in epigenetics, meaning that can, changes can occur but then revert back, is with our circadian rhythm. Uh, you can see here as uh, if you look at the, the x-axis is the x-axis is time here, that throughout the day uh, in a 12-hour cycle, that there are certain sites of our genome that are tied to circadian rhythm where you can see the changes in the uh, activation state or the accessibility of those genes vary throughout the day uh, and can be tied to uh, or correlated to our circadian rhythm. Another is neuronal plasticity uh, with some sort of uh, activation trigger, either a new learning event or uh, trying to recall a memory. There is an activate, there's an activation that occurs where there's a transcription factor called CFOS which is uh, a, a mammalian transcription factor, can activate site, uh, access sites of our genome and lead to transcription and can be tied to quote unquote learning or memory. But subsequent times where perhaps uh, those sites are no longer, those, that gene locus is no longer accessible because of changes in the chromatin accessibility that you can perhaps think of as forgetting. So, you know, for subsequent exams in your time at UVA, you can hope that those chrome insights are more accessible uh, and try and find the right learning mechanisms to make them more accessible. I thought that was funny. I thought it was a good joke. Uh, so the two primary epigenetic mechanisms that control chromatin accessibility, this was talked about in the pre-lecture. Uh, I'm gonna try and do a, a quick recap to help set the stage for what we're gonna talk about. The first is DNA methylation. It induces uh, methyl methylation. This is at on the DNA, and this is inducing chromatin compaction. Uh, it's not necessarily changing uh, the charge dramatically, but rather the actual flexibility and uh, st uh, steric hindrance or uh, the steric flexibility of the DNA there. And it DNA methylation leads to a repressing of the gene transcription at that site. Histone modification is the second uh, epigenetic uh, mechanism. And this one is a little more complicated. There's lots of different modifications that can occur. Uh, it can be a methylation, acetylation, phosphorylation. Uh, and there's also different parts of the histone. There's a certain site we're gonna talk about the, the end terminus tail, but there's different parts of that tail that can be modified. And each different modification leads to a different outcome. And so, each of these different alternatives within histone modification can lead to either the activation or repression of transcription of those genes there. So first we're gonna talk about DNA methylation first. I should stop there. Are there any questions of, uh, of what we just talked about? The different flavors of epigenetic uh, mechanisms, uh, Klein-Felter syndrome, Down syndrome, are there any questions there? Yes. 
Correct. So you can think of, um, so the, the, to try and summarize what you said there, uh, the, the main gist there was to communicate that there are both stable slash inheritable changes, uh, epigenetic changes that can be that can be passed down, or there can be epigenetic changes, uh, in, in this case, usually histone modifications that can occur and can be reversed or revert back. Uh, and so we're first gonna talk about, uh, DNA methylation is one that we're gonna talk about uh, in a moment, but this is one that typically uh, is not as, as I understand it, is less able to just simply revert back. So this is one that'll more likely be a, an, an, a stable one. So with DNA methylation, uh, a, lot of, a lot of epigenetics, as we, are, as we understand it today, a lot, of these, a lot of these understandings have come more recently. As I said, there were, you know, we, when you talk to a geneticist uh, who's been in the field for 50 years, there's a different level of understanding that led to a different definition. But now we're, we're characterizing a lot of these features better uh, each month, basically. And so, for example, we're going to talk about DNA methylation. There's a piece of it that was just more, characterized more recently than the last five to 10 years. So DNA methylation typically uh, happens on, we talk about CPG islands. Uh, so DNA methylation will happen on a cytosine, and it's going to be mediated by an enzyme called DNMT or DNA methyltransferase. As the name implies, again, with enzymes, it always helps to read it from right to left. Uh, it's a, uh, an enzyme, it transfers over a methyl group to DNA. Uh, and it does that by using a substrate called SAM or s methionine. That's the methyl donor. And so DNA methyltransferase will take the methyl group from uh, SAM and, uh, and catalyze a reaction to methylate cytosine. And so that's what DNA methyltransferase does. Now there is a way to reverse this process uh, using a, a more recently characterized enzyme called TET, or uh, we'll refer to it as D demethylase. Uh, TET, I think typically the formal name is 1011 transferase, uh, but it, it's typically just categorized as a demethylase. And the way it does that is it's a dioxygenase where it adds um, a hydroxyl group over to the methyl group uh, that was added by DNA methyltransferase. And this is an active process that requires ATP. And so subsequently what's gonna end up happening is this is also gonna leverage the endogenous base excision repair pathway. And so with a hydroxyl group that's been added by TET, TET will then again uh, add two subsequent uh, reactions that will lead to a carboxyl group here that can then by uh, either uh, passively or using the base excision repair pathway to revert this back to a cytosine. Typically it takes much longer for this to occur when we think about when we compare this to uh, the circadian, circadian rhythm pathways that were uh, more plastic. But this is, a, this is one method that uh, DNA methylation can be reversed. Uh, but again, the, the takeaway that I want you to know is that DNA methylation typically leads to the silencing of these genes that uh, it changes the flexibility of the cytosine here. And uh, this can be reverted by TET. Typically what happens is that methylation occurs on CPG islands. And so in the absence of that methylation, you'll see either increased or normal gene expression. But in the presence of a methylated CPG island near the promoter, you're gonna see decreased gene expression, decreased gene expression. there are methylation events uh, that can be regulated and passed down uh, via a really unique process called genomic imprinting. This, path, this part, uh, genomic imprinting, only occurs among a subset of genes. So we talked about several times now how in our genome and in, in uh, mammals, there are approximately 20,000 genes. Uh, for genomic imprinting, what we're going to talk about here, this only is true of a subset, maybe on the order of 200 to 250. So this is a way where DNA methylation will be erased and reset uh, before meiosis occurs among germ cells. So 
I'm going to walk you through this, uh, this figure to try and explain what genomic imprinting looks like. And so among our uh, primordial germ cells, we have uh, two N copies of our chromosomes. We have two copies of everything. And so what ends up, and we have some that come from our mother and some that come from, uh, from, from our father, the maternal and paternal ones. What we have here that's uh, laid out is in the top row, we have what's going to uh, become an, uh, an egg. And on the bottom on the blue, it's gonna, what's going to become a sperm. So what's going to end up happening is during meiosis, all of these different methylation events that are depicted by white and black, they're going to be totally erased. So there'll be no DNA methylation that's going to be present on uh, these chromosomes. And then what's going to happen is that they're going to split and you're going to have one end copy from each that's going to create what the subsequent gamete, either the egg, the egg cell or the sperm. But what's going to end up happening is that there's going to be a reestablishment of methylation events that are specific to whether it's a sperm or an egg. So if you look at what's going to end up happening here is uh, on some subsets of genes, these like 200 genes or so that I mentioned, there's going to be some that have methylation events that are totally erased and that are then remethylated simply by nature of whether they are uh, an egg or a sperm. And those methylation events are unique to either a sperm or an egg, seemingly for uh, male or female. And what's going to end up happening is that that's going to be passed down to a fertilized uh, egg and a zygote where there's going to be seemingly different methylation events that are unique to whether it came from their mother or father. And what that looks like is uh, this has been, this only happens on approximately 200 genes or so. And it's not really well understood how this happens or why. Uh, there's a really odd theory uh, called the kinship theory that tries to take a stab at explaining this, but again, it's a theory. The idea is that, for example, one, one of the genes that uh, fits with under, uh, with, within the genomic imprinting paradigm is IGF-2. IGF should sound familiar because we talked about that during our uh, steroid and angina receptors lecture. Uh, it's within, IGF-2 is within the insulin-like growth factor family. And with more uh, insulin growth factor 2, uh, as, you can, as you can imagine from what we talked about with like the pro-growth pathways that occur, with increased IGF-2, there's more growth. And the kinship theory is a way to try and explain these seemingly uh, disparate uh, methylation patterns on male and females that uh, tries to fit it within a bit of an odd paradigm, but again, it's a theory, where typically paternally expressed DNA methylation events always want to try and uh, have the uh, large, largest fetuses to try and uh, pass down their genes as much as they can. Whereas the maternally expressed uh, genomic and printing events typically try and survive and protect the, the mother and want to try and possess the ability to have subsequent uh, subsequent births or for other mammals, subsequent litters. And so typically for an example of IGF-2 here, it promotes the growth, the IGF-2 is only expressed on uh, the paternally expressed chromosomes. And so it promotes growth. It's not gonna be expressed on, it's not gonna be expressed maternally. So this means that there are some genes that are only expressed paternally and only expressed maternally. And so IGF-2 is a paternally expressed one that promotes offspring growth at the expense of the mother. IGF-2 receptor is a decoy receptor that's basically a sink and neutralizes IGF-2. And so the heart of this theory is there's like a conflicting, uh, uh, conflicting interest between uh, the mother and the father here. And so IGF-2 receptor is only maternally expressed and wants to neutralize IGF-2 so that it restricts offspring growth for the sake of the mother and for subsequent litters. And so again, this is a theory, but it's one way that tries to provide an explanation of genomic imprinting, where there are some methylation events that occur that only are passed down from the father and some that are only passed down by the mother, where it's uh, silenced in the other parent. Are there any questions here about genomic imprinting? I'll leave, I'll leave time for it to settle a little bit and give time for questions to uh, to come to the surface. Uh, histone modifications are the other epigenetic change and the main, the main uh, mechanism by which they act is on uh, dictating the accessibility of chromatin. Uh, 
And so in the pre-lecture, this was talked about a bit, but we're, uh, I'll try and provide a, a bit of a overview here. Typically what ends up happening is that these modifications happen on the end terminal tail of histones. Histones are these octamer complexes that have, uh, typically there's H2A, H2B, H2, H3, and H4. And it's two copies of each that forms this eight histone complex uh, where the end terminal tail is typically sticking out and is the site where histone modifications can occur. So in, uh, in what you can envision here is like figure A right here. Uh, this is the end terminal tail that's laid out. And there are lysine residues that are acetylated at different portions here. And what ends up happening is that uh, the lysine that's positively charged uh, will want to be coiled up around the negatively charged phosphate backbone of DNA. And typically with no acetyl group, it'll be coiled up and make the uh, DNA inaccessible there. The acetyl group will neutralize the charge of the lysine. So uh, the, what will end up happening is with an acetyl group on a lysine, it'll neutralize the charge and make the DNA at that site more accessible. And so we have enzymes, histone acetyl transferases that mediate adding that acetyl group uh, to different amino acid residues on histones. And we also have histone deacetylases that take away these acetyl groups. And so we have, uh, we also refer to that as HDAX, histone acetylases HDAX. And so what you can see here in the figures in part B, you can see uh, the acetyl, histone acetyl transferase uh, modifying the, uh, the end terminal tails of histone, and you're seeing them subsequently being more opened up, meaning that the DNA at those sites are more accessible for transcription, for transcription factors and RNA pol 2 to come in and mediate transcription. When an HDAC is present, it's removing the acetyl groups on uh, some of these amino acids and leading to the coiling up and lack of accessibility of transcription factors in RNA Pol 2. And there's a bit of a nomenclature here that uh, helps to define what the modifications are. So it's always going to be which histone, in this case, it's H3, uh, what the amino acid is and what number. So this is lysine 9 and it's being acetylated. And so this is just one easy way to try and define what those modifications are uh, in a more shorthand approach. There are different histone marks, like I said earlier, that are possible. So acetylation uh, is oftentimes associated with active transcription because it happens on the order of minutes. And so quickly when acetylation events occur, there's a subsequent transcription that can happen pretty fairly, that fairly quickly afterwards. Uh, histones can also be phosphorylated, and that can happen. We talked about some of the different amino acids that are phosphorylated. So, for example, here, this is histone 3 that's phosphorylated at serine 10, and this happens on the orders of minutes or hours. We talked about DNA being methylated. Here, histones themselves, these are proteins, they can be methylated as well, and that can order on the, happen on the order of days here. So, what ends up happening is we also have histone methyl transferases that mediate that methylation event on our histones and histone demethylases that remove, uh, the, uh, remove the methyl group. Uh, one thing to try and remove confusion here, this says on the bottom underneath HMT for histone methyl transferase, it says atomet. That's the same thing that we saw earlier as SAM, uh, S-acetylmethionine. So this is just another way to name that group that donates the methyl group for uh, methylation. And you can have uh, one, two, or three methylation events on a histone, uh, and it'll typically be uh, identified. Are there, are there any questions so far? I'm going to stop. I want, I want two questions. Yes, Laura. You're asking, you're asking, is histone methylase uh, a name? Uh, I typically only hear methyl transferase, just because it's typically, uh, I mean, sometimes enzymes will go by different names. I've typically only heard uh, histone methyl transferase. Yeah. 
All right, so we've talked about previously how, uh, oh, and last thing. So uh, epigenetics, uh, if you have not already appreciated, can be very complicated. And memorizing what each modification does is really hard. And I'm not asking you to memorize what each modification does. But what I will ask is for you to appreciate the time scale for acetylation, phosphorylation, and methylation, as well as being able to decipher the nomenclature for these histone modifications. I will not ask you to memorize on lysine four on histone three, if you get two methyl groups or three, what does that lead to for that gene transcription? I'm not gonna ask you that because uh, I don't know if many professors will say this, uh, most professors will not be able to memorize exactly what each one of these does, at least uh, those who don't actively do this all the time. There are people who specialize in epigenetics that know this front, frontwards and backwards. Uh, most professors don't. So I'm also not going to ask you to memorize every single histone modification and what the outcome is. I do want to try and be clear and ask you to take note of these three different modifications, acetylation, phosphorylation, methylation, the time scale in which they occur, as well as being able to decipher the, the nomenclature for how we write out these modifications. Again, I'm not asking you to memorize every single modification because on the next slide, you will appreciate the complexity that might be more complex than anything we've talked about yet in this class. Um, so there's a histone code that allows you to identify and determine, understand what's happening and where it's happening. The number of possible combinations of histone modifications is incredibly large. Uh, we have histone level modifications. We have modifications that can happen at the nucleosome level. That's the, with the, the nucleosome is the octamer complex of eight histones with DNA wrapped around it, typically about 150 base pairs of DNA. We have local level, DNA level methylation that can occur, uh, as well as higher order changes that can happen. Uh, the potential for highly, th there's what this leads to is complex gene regulation that can be fairly hard to study, but is a growing area of research. And to give you a sense of what this looks like, uh, if we were to zoom in on one single uh, nucleosome, basically, with uh, our, our eight histones, if we zoomed in on H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, each of these little uh, each of these little figures are all different kinds of histone modifications at different amino acids. And at each amino acid, there are different kinds of modifications that can occur. What this leads to are numbers that can, uh, the uh, degree of uh, variability that can result from this. This is a number that uh, Dr. Zunder calculated for us. Uh, what in combination of, for each histone, this is among some of the most complex numbers, uh, or not complex, the, the largest numbers in nature that we can, um, we can reach. And so the degree of variability we already had was fairly high with DNA, uh, with, with some of the ways in which it's uh, regulated. Layering on epigenetic modifications and changes, there's a gr an even greater degree of complexity. And so there are just now groups that are starting to appreciate and study this using some new methods that uh, Dr. Zunder talked about in the pre-lecture, but this is to give affirmation to the looks on your faces right now. This is quite complicated and, and really hard to study, but again, we're gonna focus at this, on this, at a, a, try to stay at a high level so that you can appreciate this and hold this with some of the things that we've already talked about um, without trying to overwhelm you. So far, I don't think I'm doing a good job, but I'll try and do better for the rest of this lecture. So uh, we've talked about epigenetics. I think hopefully the remainder of this lecture will feel less overwhelming. Uh, and actually, I really like what we're gonna talk about as well next. We talked about epigenetics. Next, we're gonna talk about non-coding RNAs and the layer of regulation that they provide uh, that can help elaborate central dogma a little bit more. Non-coding RNAs, as the name implies, they're RNA, so it's transcribed regions of our genome. Uh, that are not translated. They do not encode for a protein. So uh, non-coding RNAs, number one, are everywhere. And number two, there are a lot of them. To give you a sense of the scope, uh, there is very little of our cellular RNA is actually mRNA. Uh, 
when we talked about central dogma, uh, at least the way it's couched, it's very easy to think that the uh, mRNAs are at the center stage of everything. They're incredibly important because they encode our protein. But if you look at our RNA on a cell by cell basis by mass or simply by number of molecules, uh, mRNAs are not, uh, they, are, they, they do not come out on top. So either ribosomal RNAs or uh, uh, tRNAs are dwarf mRNAs, but we're gonna talk about some of the other uh, RNAs that we did not cover in transcription or translation. And those are going to be the non-coding RNAs here, uh, specifically microRNAs or miRNA, as well as uh, link RNAs or long non-coding. So we, this slide is going to lay out different uh, non-coding RNAs that possess specific functions. So we talked about ribosomal uh, RNAs and tRNAs uh, and their roles in transcription uh, and translation. Uh, microRNAs, or uh, here, we, their label is M miRNAs. We typically refer to them as microRNAs. Uh, they help facilitate sequence-specific downregulation of uh, mRNA transcripts by a process that we refer to as RNA interference. Uh, RNA interference was characterized uh, and won the Nobel Prize about 15, probably 20 years ago. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's an incredibly important pro process that helps with the regulation post-transcriptionally of mRNA transcripts. And one of the ways that this occurs is with microRNAs. Uh, another important non-coding RNA that we're going to focus on that's going to be really important for the disease backdrop that we're going to be talking about are uh, link or long non-coding RNAs. Um, they can act as what we call as an RNA sponge by base pair hybridization or base pair, uh, base pair pairing up. Or they can, because they are so large, they can actually play a protein-like role where they will uh, form these complexes uh, uh, that form these large groups with either other RNAs or other proteins that help regulate um, transcription uh, and translation. Other important non-coding RNAs, uh, some of which we talked about. Uh, we talked about uh, SNRNA, SNRNAs that are part of the spliceosome that form the SNRP. Uh, and there's also SNO RNAs that uh, help pro provide modifications of other RNAs. Uh, but again, we're going to be focusing today on microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs. So the means by which microRNAs uh, provide RNA interference uh, has been characterized in uh, fruit, fruit flies as well. And even some of the names and uh, the proteins that are part of this process derive their name from fruit fly genes. And so there's a microRNA that is in its, that has been transcribed. Uh, and they're typically, as the name applies, microRNA, they're a lot smaller. And so what ends up happening is uh, they're, they are transcribed by RNA Paul II, just like other trans, uh, mRNA transcripts. Uh, they will be capped, they will be polyadenylated, and they'll be spliced. But what ends up happening is that there is an important uh, protein called drosha that will clip off and remove the cap uh, and the ends of the microRNA molecule. And just to give you a heads up, some of these terms are in blue, so it's, it's, it'll be helpful for you to know what each of these proteins do and where they carry out their function. So drosha, while still in the nucleus, will cut off the ends and the cap of the uh, precursor microRNA. And once that uh, end has been cut and now it's in a simple hairpin form, it's going to be exported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And we have another protein called dicer. Uh, an easy way, this is how I always remembered it, an easy way to remember what dicer does is it dices off the loop. Uh, it removes the loop at the end of the microRNA. And one thing I should have noted that I forgot to say is that there's, uh, there's a hairpin structure here that we've talked about in the past here that uh, demonstrates that there's a self-complementarity within microRNAs here. And so, it, uh, and so these are also targets for processing to help promote a mature microRNA after dicer is cut off the loop. And so what ends up happening here is we have this microRNA duplex and there are different schools of thought of how to refer to the different strands here. Some call them a guide microRNA uh, arm, and another one's just a passenger that's long for the ride. 
Um, other people have demonstrated that both parts are important. Uh, I'm of the school of thought that actually both parts are important. Because of that, we have different nomenclature, or at least that's how I was taught. Uh, but for now, I'll just refer to them as passenger and guide. So what ends up happening is that uh, the, ar the, the arm of the duplex that is what's referred to as the guide microRNA is going to be loaded into this protein called Argonaut or uh, uh, Argo. Sometimes uh, the protein is called Argo2. What ends up happening is that it's going to guide, bind the guide strand of the microRNA. And once that guide strand is loaded within Argonaut, it's, it forms what we call the risk complex, the RNA-induced silencing complex. So RNA interference, the entire goal of it is to stop the translation of specific MR, of some mRNA transcripts. MicroRNAs are incredible because while they are small nu uh, nucleotide sequences, they target, can target uh, on the order of hundreds of proteins and act across all of them with different degrees of complementarity to them, but still are able to do so uh, with the two methods I'm about to describe here. So in the case where the guide strand has pretty good complementarity to a target mRNA transcript, what will end up happening is that it'll bind to it within the, within the risk complex and promote the cleavage of that mRNA transcript. And if you guys remember what ends up happening when an mRNA transcript uh, has an open end that's not protected by the poly A tail and poly A binding proteins, it's going to be degraded and exonucleases are going to come in and um, degrade that mRNA transcript, uh, leading to an outcome where that mRNA transcript is not able to go to translation and create its subsequent protein. There are other instances, like I said, microRNAs can target hundreds of different proteins. There are some instances where there's somewhat sufficient uh, complementarity. And when it's, uh, when that happens, what ends up happening is that the guide strand loaded with an argonaut to make the risk complex will bind, uh, somewhat effectively to that mRNA transcript. And rather than cleaving it for degradation, it'll just bind and inhibit translation from occurring. And so the two main ways that microRNA can inhibit, uh, translation is either by great complementarity and leading to the uh, cleavage of that mRNA transcript or just inhibiting translation altogether and binding it and inhibiting that. And so all of this, this process of interfering with RNAs to inhibit, uh, to inhibit the mRNA to going to translation, all of this is referred to as RNA interference. And what's happened in the lab is that this has become an incredible research tool that has led to people trying to leverage this in two different ways. So in the lab, if we have a specific gene of interest that we wanna try and target, we can create uh, and uh, design a specific double-stranded RNA uh, that's usually on the order of 18 to 25 nucleotides long. Uh, and bless you, what's gonna end up happening is that it'll be processed similar to everything we just described, but we're just providing the mature micro, micro RNA we call it a, a SI RNA or a silencing RNA uh, that targets a specific mRNA transcript and leads to gene suppression. Another way is to actually uh, design a DNA plasmid uh, that will actually be under the control of RNA Paul three that when transcribed will produce a short hairpin RNA or SH RNA that is then uh, processed and then goes through the same process. And so silencing RNAs or short hairpin RNAs are ways within the lab that we've leveraged this RNA interference process to try and silence genes. Uh, so are there any questions on microRNAs? Yes. Yeah, so we have a DNA plasmid where there's uh, a specific, uh, there'll be a, 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 a a DNA plasmid that will be transfected into a cell that encodes for a specific RNA molecule that's going to be created and transcribed by RNA Paul three because of the specific promoter that's been designed within that plasmid. What's going to end up happening is it's going to lead, it's going to lead to the transcription of this short hairpin RNA. So here it's leading to the uh, production of this short hairpin, hairpin RNA that's going to be processed 
to a double-stranded RNA. And then it's going to go through the same process as microRNA or the silencing RNA to the left column here, where it'll be uh, processed and one single guide strand will be loaded into Argonaut and will target a specific mRNA transcript to lead to the eventual end goal of suppressing and silencing a gene. Not changing anything at the gene level, but rather silencing the product, the mRNA, of transcription of that gene. Are there any other questions on microRNAs or RNA interference? Yes. So typically for microRNAs, it can, it can uh, suppress multiple different proteins that are encoded on different genes. So like all of these, uh, there can be, you know, a hundred genes that encode for a hundred different proteins. Again, for eukaryotes or mammals, one uh, mRNA transcript encodes for one gene. And so what ends up happening is uh, when those mRNA transcripts are created, a, uh, one specific uh, microRNA, so like one that I studied that uh, was really cool, it was microRNA 155. They all typically have numbers with them. Uh, and so it targeted, from what I can last remember, about 150 different mRNA transcripts that are associated with 150 different genes. And so it can, based on like how complementary they are, it can target them uh, and What's going to, it's going to, uh, the mRNA transcripts are the products of genes being expressed and a way to suppress them is to target the transcripts and silence them that way. And so we typically refer to this as gene, as uh, a way to knock down gene expression to target with through RNA interference where we target and, uh, degrade, uh, the transcripts. Does that help? Okay. So long known non-coding RNAs, uh, typically are longer uh, than 200 nucleotides. It's an arbitrary cutoff, but that's typically what it's, uh, how they're defined. Uh, just, like, uh, just like mRNA transcripts, they are transcribed by RNA pol 2 five, five, five prime cap spliced and polydentylated. But again, they do not encode for a protein that'll be translated. So some of the different functions here, they can, they're able to regulate protein activity by nature of how large they are in their secondary structure, uh, where they have these large uh, different domains with lots of hairpins that permit them to interact with proteins and regulate their activity. Uh, in addition to that, there's also the opportunity to uh, provide post-transcriptional regulation uh, by competing with microRNAs. And so based, because of how large they are, there's the ability for some of their regions to be complementary to a microRNA and can actually uh, inhibit microRNA activity and allow for gene expression to occur and to avoid the degradation of an mRNA transcript. Uh, finally, they can also provide direct transcriptional control, and that's gonna be relevant to uh, the disease background that we're gonna talk about today. So we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, uh, dosage, uh, gene dosage is just really the number of copies of a gene that's available. And when there's trisomy or, multiple, or three copies of a chromosome, we have 50% more gene copies. So there's, uh, more, there's an increase in gene dosage. One way that that's compensated for uh, is, oh, sorry, I'm going to take a step back. Forgive me. Uh, so specifically on sex chromosomes, uh, uh, males have an XY and uh, females have uh, two copies of the X chromosome. Uh, and so there's an issue here where there are two copies of everything that's on the X chromosome. And so there's a gene dosage issue here that is addressed by a strategy that's called X inactivation. So during early development, one copy of the X chromosome uh, in all females is, target, is randomly targeted and permanently inactivated. That inactivated X chromosome is called XI. And there's the the X chromosome that is active is called XA. And so there's, uh, that's the mechanism by which uh, rather than having a gene dosage problem where there's, two there's too many copies of genes that are expressed on the X chromosome, X activation will inactivate one of those X chromosomes to mediate that problem. 
Uh, and the way in which that's done is by a long non-coding RNA uh, called EXIST, uh, X inactivation, X inactive specific transcript, EXIST. Uh, the way that happens is by epigenetics. What ends up occurring is that EXIST uh, is encoded on the X chromosome. And as it's being transcribed, uh, it'll actually physically, it's able to bind to the DNA. It'll physically coat the X chromosome, one of the X chromosomes, uh, and as more, there's a nucleating event here where as more of them bind, they kind of all uh, begin to cluster together and is able to uh, spread throughout the, the entire length of the uh, X chromosome that's gonna be inactivated. And that's gonna recruit protein complexes that promote uh, an epigenetic silencing of the entire X chromosome there that becomes inactivated. And so this is going to this is going to uh, promote the recruitment of uh, or promote pr recruit proteins that promote DNA methylation uh, as well as uh, histone methylation and histone hypoacetylation, which all contribute to this gr uh, goal of silencing this X chromosome. And so this long non-coding RNA, once it targets and uh, inactivates a specific X chromosome. Uh, it forms this heterochromatic body called a bar body, where that X chromosome is, for lack of a better phrase, uh, packaged up and put in a corner. And it's referred to as a bar body that's bundled up and covered by this excess long non-coding RNA. And so this is an image uh, where they actually are able to tar uh, probe for excess RNA and identify the bar body simply by looking for that long non-coding RNA. Are there any questions there? Yes, uh, yeah, so the, our chromatin can be bundled up and compacted. And so that's heterochromatin. Euchromatin is when our uh, histones, uh, our chromatin is more open and accessible. That's what we refer to as euchromatin. So heterochromatin is just a catch-all phrase for bundled up, compacted chromatin. So the identification of which X chromosome uh, is going to become inactivated is random. And so how uh, to quickly just provide a little bit of information of how, it, how it's random is through a combination of this competition and feedback that occurs. So EXIST uh, is encoded on a specific strand of uh, a specific strand of the uh, DNA along the X chromosome. Complementary to that, the, that's the sense, the antisense, the opposite and uh, complementary uh, sequence of the DNA there on the X chromosome for to exist, we call T6. It's the antisense to that uh, exist long non-coding RNA. So typically what ends up happening is that along, uh, over time what happens is that the X, the XI, the inactivated X chromosome, is defined by excess coding it in a silencing of the T6 uh, long non-coding RNA, that antisense. Uh, and the active X chromosome is defined by T6 expression and the silencing of excess. And so typically what's going to end up happening is that there's going to be one X chromosome that's going to promote the expression of excess uh, and silencing T6. And it's going to be the opposite for the, uh, that's for inactive. That's going to be opposite for the active. And so again, T6 just is, you can imagine it as uh, the opposite uh, to what excess is doing. And that's depicted here on this figure. And so the two provide feedback and compete. Uh, they have competing goals with one another. And so one of them will eventually win out on one X chromosome to silence that, or to inactivate that one. So. Taking all of this back to Klinefelter and Down syndrome. In Klinefelter syndrome, uh, we end up having this extra X chromosome. Um, but what ends up happening is that there's X inactivation that silences the X, that extra X chromosome. Um, some of the, uh, there's not typically total silencing. And so some of the genes that emerge from that extra X chromosome lead to the phenotype in Klinefelter syndrome. However, this X inactivation of, on, uh, on the X chromosome, that does not exist for other chromosomes. 
So other chromosomal disorders are typically more, have a more severe presentation because they don't have this inactivation feedback. So in Down syndrome, there's no mechanism to silence the extra copy of chromosome 21. And so despite chromosome 21, if you actually look at uh, an image of all the different chromosomes lined up against each other, chromosome 21, again, is pretty small. But because there's no mecha mechanism to silence the extra copy, there's a very severe uh, clinical, there's a more severe clinical representation when compared to Klinefelter syndrome. Another trisomy disorder is Edwards syndrome, which is trisomy 18. It's a third copy of the 18th chromosome, uh, which leads to defects in many organs. It leads to microcephaly. Uh, if many of you remember from the Zika virus, microcephaly is uh, literally just a smaller head. Uh, and fewer than 10% of patients diagnosed with it live past one year. Um, and so typically when they're, whenever, uh, typically when uh, someone has a baby that's due, there's the opportunity for genetic screening. And a lot of them try and identify some of these trisomy disorders. And there's some specific ones that they look for. And one of them is trisomy 18. So implications of uh, X chromosome inactivation. So in tabby cats, uh, so I'll take a step back and say this, uh, all females show mosaic expression because uh, they all have two copies of X chromosomes uh, that, provide, uh, that provide the opportunity for different uh, levels of expression of different genes. And so an example of that is the tabby cat where the pigmentation gene for their fur is encoded on the X chromosome. And what ends up happening is that they have different, uh, different uh, copies of the pigment genes on that X chromosome that leads to different pigmentation across their fur. Uh, the white fur is encoded on a totally different pigmentation locus, uh, but the uh, the ones that are uh, present, the ones that are present up up top are for a specific locus on the X chromosome. Hemophilia is an excellent mutation that uh, is specific to specific factors within the clotting cascade, and because it's X-linked, um, typically what can happen is that in females that have uh, if there's a mutation for it on the X chromosome. Uh, what ends up happening is that the inactivated X chromosome that's in the bar body can actually be used to uh, express the other, those clotting factors on this other chromosome. Whereas for males, there's no second copy of an X chromosome to accommodate that. So typically hemophilia is overwhelmingly present in males because there's only one copy of the X chromosome. Uh, finally, the last X-linked disorder is Rett syndrome. Uh, it is a somatic, which means it's not germline, uh, X-linked mutation that originates from the paternal copy of MECP2, which is a uh, protein that binds to methylated CPG DNA. And what ends up happening is that uh, it's typically only observed in females because usually because of the one copy that uh, males have, they will typically die in utero or fairly quickly after birth. But what happens over time is that uh, typically female patients that have this syndrome uh, do not have any presentation early on in, in age after birth, but over time will have developmental, have neurodegenerative uh, disorder that develops over time as a result of this mutation on the X chromosome. Uh, there was a really incredible study that was published about 10 years ago that tried to provide a proof of concept for chromosomal therapy for Down syndrome patients. Um, and what they did was trying to use uh, a long non-coding RNA exist for uh, the extra copy of the 21st chromosome. So what ended up happening was in this study, they took a biopsy punch of, uh, they took a sample of a Down syndrome patient's skin and uh, they collected their fibroblasts. Again, we talked about fibroblasts. We talked about how amazing and cool they are. I'm biased because I study them, but we all agree they're really cool. What, ended up, what they ended up doing was there's a, a unique way to transform any cell into an embryonic-like stem cell. Uh, through the activation of specific transcription factors, you can take any adult cell and turn it into what we call, to, what we call an induced pluripotent stem cell. And so with this induced pluripotent stem cell, they were able to, they were able to uh, provide it a transfection of this X-cyst long non-coding RNA in, and they used uh, what is called a zinc finger nuclease. Uh, we've talked a lot about 
CRISPR, Cas9, we've alluded to it a bunch. Uh, Cas9 is an endonuclease that helps provide uh, with, a, with a specific RNA as a guide to have very specific targeted DNA uh, gene editing. Zinc finger nuclease was an old version uh, of what was able to be used. And so in the study, uh, with a combination of excess long non-coding RNA and uh, zinc finger nuclease, they were able to try and silence this specific extra copy of the 21st chromosome. And in what they transfected, there was a, um, the receptor that responds to something called doxycycline. And so in response to doxycycline, doxycycline treatment, they were able to inactivate one of the copies of that 21st chromosome and have it um, secluded in a bar body as a way to say, as a way to demonstrate that this is a possible approach to chromosome therapy for Down syndrome patients. And they were able, uh, using methods to image uh, excess long non coding RNA, they're able to see that chromosome 21 was indeed uh, secluded within a bar body in a heterochromatin state uh, and seemingly remove one of those copies of the 21st chromosome. If epigenetics, long non-coding RNA, or developmental disorders interest you, we have a great group of people that study this. Uh, two people that I know who are, uh, that are always uh, uh, enthusiastic about undergrads joining their labs, particularly Nathan Shetfield and Mete Chibalek. Uh, great people that look at epigenetics. Uh, and the other, uh, the other two professors here are also part of the Disability Studies Initiative that look at specific disorders as they relate to um, chromosomal disorders. With that, thank you for your time. I'll, I'll actually stop there. Are there any questions? We have, we have a few minutes. Are there any questions about what we've talked about? Because this was a lot. Uh, it was trying to tie together a lot of different things we've talked about and including uh, a new complicated subject. So. Uh, I want to have two questions before you guys leave here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Are you talking about the uh, for the for? The example with the cat that was just uh, trying to just explain how uh, there's a mosaic. Uh, having multiple copies of the X chromosome can provide an opportunity to, to have like a mosaic like appearance, uh, as specifically demonstrated with tabby cats. Hemophilia that's just that's a disorder that's tied to the X chromosome, and because females have multiple copies of the X chromosome, they can uh, help compensate for that mutation, whereas males only have one copy. That mutation is all they have, so they make dysfunctional um, clotting factors that lead to hemophilia. I do wonder, sorry, you just brought up a good point. Uh, there are some people that have different colored eyes. And so, uh, sorry? I thought it was heterochromia. I might be wrong. I always just tie it to one of my favorite pitchers in baseball, Max Scherzer. And so, like, uh, it makes me wonder if there's a if there is an associated association with what we've talked about with that. I haven't looked it up, but um, for any Nationals fans, that was for you. Uh, any other questions? Yes. What determines that is a very good question. I, I don't know what's determining. So I, I suspect at least with methylation events, because they're far more flexible, they're, they become far more inflexible and there's a longer process for the removal of that methyl group. Like there's a lot more steps for TET to act and remove the methyl group. Whereas for deacetylation, there's an HDAC, there's histone deacetylase um, that seems to act a lot more directly. And so, I suspect a lot of it has to do, it's, uh, it's all comes down to the uh, rate of activity of these different enzymes, but I'll take a look into that further because that's, this is still, again, epigenetics is still a growing field. We're still understanding a lot of this, but I, I, I suspect there's an answer out there that I can find for that. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh,
I should have asked the question before I was about to dis dismiss all of you. So that was probably an emotional whiplash, but thanks. You, thank you for sticking around. You guys have a good day.